chapter 52, verse 7, and Romans, chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. And let's see the scripture in Isaiah. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of a messenger who proclaims peace, who brings good news, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God rules. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. So how can they call upon someone they don't have faith in? And how can they have faith in someone they haven't heard of? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. Our next scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Hear now this word of the Lord. <clears throat> the eleven disciples went to Galilee, up to the mountain, just as Jesus told them to do. And when they got there, they saw Jesus, and they worshipped him, though some doubted. And Jesus said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them all of the commands that I have given you. And remember, I am with you always, to the very end the age. Just the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we have heard your word spoken. Now, Lord, help it to dwell within us. Give us ears that we might hear. Give us hearts to understand. And do not let us leave here today unless we leave changed. This we ask and pray in your name. Amen. His feet were always filthy. Now I'm not talking about my 21-month-old son who does have filthy feet most of the time. I'm talking about my brother Thomas who throughout high school, ran cross-country. Now, have any of y'all ever ran cross-country before? We actually have someone in here who has. I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> early service, no one did at all. Because you see, cross-country is not for the faint of heart. Um, cross-country is one of those sports where you're racing against yourself, really. You're not as much trying to beat the person next to you as you are trying to beat your last time. I mean, it helps to come in first, right? You get a nice medal for that. But it's a game where you really want to be the best you can so that you're the best, not that, so that you're better than someone else. And in cross country, you're not running on a track. You're not running a, um, a set course that's made necessarily for running. You're running wherever they've set you to run, right? And for however long they set you to run, you go over hills, you go on sidewalks, you go on the roads sometimes, you go through dry creek beds, you go through not so dry creek beds. Uh, in Burnett High School, you run through the practice football field, which is usually covered in mud anyways because no one takes very good care of the practice football field. Uh, you cannot run cross country and come out as sweet and clean as you were when you started the race. It just seems to be impossible. And with my brother Thomas, it seemed like every time he would go to his morning practices, he would come back dirtier than the day before. Which is fine if you clean off before you walk into the house. <laughs> he didn't really do this.
this all the time, though. And my mom would get mad when he would track in that dirt and grime and mud from the outside into the house. Uh, it got to where he was so dirty and so filthy that he didn't just have to take off his shoes and wash off his feet before he came in the room. My mom actually made him strip outside and hose off with the hose, take a shower outside before he could towel off and come inside the house. And as his brother, I thought it was hilarious. Him, not so much. He didn't like it. But he had to make sure that he no longer had those dirty feet before he came in the house. He was good at cross country, though. My brother went to state both his junior and senior year and came near close to winning his senior year, winning state cross country. He was fast. We would go and we would have races just for fun outside, and we would try to even the odds a little bit. And so we would do things like I would have to run 400 meters, and he would have to run 800 meters backwards. <laughs> and dang it, if not every time, he won. He was fast. And part of that's because I'm slow. But he was fast. <laughs> and he would have lived in ancient Greece. He would have had one of two roles. He would have either been a warrior, because my brother's one of those kind of people that he's all that and more. Or he would have been what's called a euangelion. A messenger of good news. You see, after a major battle had been won, the winning army would send out these euangelions, these messengers, to go back to their country's major cities and to share the good news of victory with the people who lived there, so that they could know that their armies had won a decisive battle. These gospel bringers were everyone's best friends, because when they came to town, you knew that they brought good news. Evangelions were sought after. People would stand at the edges of the city and wait for them to come in the midst of war, so that they could hear of the good news of victory. This was an honor post, given only to the fastest of runners, so that they could share this good news as quickly as possible, with as many people as possible. Now, we're talking about running over great, great distances. You can imagine how filthy their feet would have been. Dirty feet on the UN Delion, on a good news messenger, would have been celebrated. Because think about it this way. If you've got not so good news to tell, are you going to go as fast as you could? Or are you going to drag your feet a little bit? In fact, I wonder if that's where that saying came from. <laughs> Are you going to go as fast as you can if you have great news to share? Absolutely. You're not going to stop to clean off your feet before you enter into a city to share that good news. You're going to go barreling in and yelling at the top of your voice the good news of victory. And so when you saw that you went yelling on running in, and he was covered in mud from head to toe, you knew that there was good news to hear. You knew that there was a victory. Maybe even a sweeping victory at that. Filthy feet on a euangelion was a sign of glory. A sign of pride. A sign of national victory. Something worth celebrating. And so I can guarantee you that if they tracked a little bit of mud into the house, no one was yelling at them. <laughs> No one was making them pose off before they get to In fact, I'm sure that those tracks of mud were celebrated. The good news messenger stopped here. Look, you can see his footprint. It would have been something to celebrate. Can you imagine that? Celebrating dirty feet? Now, we live in a very clean culture, right? We expect people to shower on a daily basis. We expect that if you're covered in mud, you're going to clean yourself off before you walk in the house. He 
these people would have celebrated that money. Does that seem a little backward to you? Does seem a little wrong, maybe? The truth is that God calls us to celebrate these dirty feet, good news breakers. Because you see, the word euangelion is a word that we still use today. Because euangelion is not only the messenger of good news, euangelion is also the good news itself. So when we look in our Bibles and we see the word gospel, when we see the words good news, that's translated in the Greek word euangelion. The person who brought this good news would have been considered the greatest of messengers because they were bringing the news of Christ's sweeping victory over sin and death. Euangelions for the church are gospel bringers. Those willing to share the good news. This is, by the way, where we get the word evangelism, right? Euangelion, evangelism, it comes from the same root word in Greek. We have been given the great news of victory in Christ Jesus. We have a choice to make. We have a choice whether we are going to join the ranks of good news bringers in sharing this wonderful message of victory or the choice of keeping it to ourselves of not going and sharing it. Christ calls us to be dirty feet evangelists, to share the good news with a world that desperately needs to hear it. This is why Isaiah says what he says in chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, who pronounce salvation and victory, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Those who are willing to go out and share this good news not only should be celebrated, but we should say that their feet are beautiful because they are the tools that were used for this. Now that sounds a little bit backward too, doesn't it? I mean, in this day and age, if you want to talk about feet, most of the time people are going to cringe a little bit, right? In fact, in the church, right around the time that we're getting ready for Holy Week and for Easter, the question always comes up, are we going to do a foot washing service? And, you know, some people get really gung-ho about this because it's a wonderful, um, wonderful way to look at the, the ministry that Jesus did. But most people are like, I don't want to show my feet. I don't want to touch other people's feet. That's just wrong. But Isaiah is saying that beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. Therefore, we as Christians should see our feet as beautiful, because this is what we've been called to. The feet of the gospel bringer are beautiful and worth celebrating, because they are the instruments that God uses to bring God's news of sweeping victory to the world. Thomas taught me this. By coming in the house every day after cross-country practice, covered in mud. Dirty feet evangelists are to be praised for the work that they do in sharing the gospel. And it's something that we really need to hear in this day and age. Because it's too easy to get caught up in our society's need for clean. I'm not just talking about not being dirty. We in our society kind of feel like everything has to be just so. Everything has to fit into the box that we've defined it as. Everything has to be politically correct. And you can't venture outside of that without getting in trouble. Everything has to be whitewashed. Or as um, one of my favorite SNL sketches calls, a bummer-free zone. 
uh, there was a, a, an SNL sketch, Saturday Night Live sketch. Uh, it was right at the end of the, the Bush administration and right at the beginning of the Obama administration where uh, George Bush was in the uh, Oval Office and he was doing whatever George Bush does at the desk and a Secret Service guy comes in and he whispers in George Bush's ear. And George Bush gets all mad and he says, what are you talking about? You can't tell me that. I've declared the Oval Office to be a bummer-free zone. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Now, granted, I don't think that George W. did that at all. I'm not saying that. But just that idea that we could declare anything a bummer-free zone, especially an office that deals with so much international crisis, is hilarious. Until you realize that, you know, we kind of do that with the church. We don't want to talk about the brokenness out there. We don't want to talk about the darkness in the world. We want to focus on the good. And the good's there. And the good should be lifted up and celebrated. But when we whitewash the world, when we declare our sanctuaries to be bummer-free zones, we do a disservice to the work that God has done in the world. Because we don't recognize the need to still go out and share the gospel message with a world that still desperately needs to hear it. Our sanctuaries cannot be bummer-free zones. They need to be areas where we come to worship to recharge and then go back out into the world to do the ministry that God so desperately needs us to do. Because the words of Jesus Christ continually call us out. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Not build beautiful churches and wait for everyone to come to you. Go and make disciples. If we want to be dirty feet evangelists, we have to be willing to go out into the world, to go out into the brokenness and darkness and dirt and mud, get our feet a little bit dirty, and share with the world the great news of God's victory over sin and death. This is the duty of the church, to share the gospel message, to become euangelions ourselves. I would be overwhelmed if next week everyone came in here tracking in mud. <laughs> everyone came in ready to tell the stories of the great work that we did in sharing God's great news. I'll go ahead and say it. I would even be willing to clean the carpets <laughs> if we came in with our dirty feet having gone and done God's work. We have to do it. We have to go. This is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans 10. This is the whole point of what it means to be the church. For how then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard of? And how can they hear without someone proclaiming it to them? How can they proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. Let's go get our feet a little bit better. Amen.